What's up folks, welcome to Found Flicks. On today's Ending Explained, we'll be looking at the streaming original Wounds, starring Army Hammer and Dakota Johnson as a couple who encounter disturbing and mysterious things after he brings home a phone that was left behind at his bar. When it comes to streaming flicks, nowadays it's a dime a dozen with how much there is out there. But Wounds manages to carve out its own place amongst the clutter and manages to create an interesting, bizarre, and unique horror film. The overall story was very weird and went into several unexpected directions, which is always a plus in my book. Now the wounds of the title, as we come to learn, has several meanings. Literal wounds that are tied to the evil entity at the core of our story, but also emotional wounds that manifest themselves through our directionless main character, Will. He's a hopeless alcoholic, I mean like constantly drunk, with no discernible desire to ever get his life on track, and has tenuous relationships that are pushed to the brink and beyond. All because on the surface, Will appears to be normal, but at his core is simply empty inside which all ties into his character arc over the course of the movie. It all builds up to a completely out there ending that definitely bears some explaining. So we'll be looking in depth at not only the surprising ending, but also what we learn about the evil entity that torments him, how the ritual comes together, what the ritual of wounds actually is, and every other lingering question the movie leaves. So let's get explaining. Initially charming, affable bartender Will seems fairly content in his life, in spite of working in an absolute dump of an establishment. And already Already things are starting to creep in from dark corners, namely cockroaches. It's symbolic of the darkness entering Will's life, but also, yeah, the bar is fucking gross. Probably cockroaches all over the place. Although it seems it's really only due to regular Alicia's presence that Will is ever content, clearly having feelings for her even though she has a boyfriend and he has a girlfriend as well. But it's nothing but harmless chatter and flirting, never anything of real substance. Everyone enjoying themselves and getting absolutely plastered, one for you and one for me. No better job for an alcoholic than being a bartender. You basically drink for free. Think of all the money that must save. This guy's a genius at economically killing himself. Though what looks like a typical night at Rosie's takes a sudden turn with the return of Eric, who lives in an apartment above the bar and is a real charmer. First seen puking his guts out on the stairs before heading to the bar. Now that is some serious pre-gaming, bud. He bumps into Jeffrey and quick to anger is about to beat the crap out of him, but composes himself buying a drink to patch things up, but still coming across as judging him. Another new face orders drinks for his mates and looks about 15 even though he does have an ID. His friends on the other hand, probably not, and they're definitely underage. But Will calls the whole thing harmless, and that's a great attitude to have. Yeah, serving underage kids, smart move. A bar fight breaks out between Eric and one of his posse, quickly getting out of hand when Eric gets a broken bottle jammed into his face, causing him to pulverize his attacker with his bare knuckles. Even though his injury is looking pretty severe, he refuses to go to the hospital, and everyone flees when Will calls the cops. When cleaning up later, he finds that one of the kids has left their phone behind, which will forever alter the course of his life. He finally stumbles home to his girlfriend Claire, trying to proposition her, which she declines, saying she's too sleepy. Ah, well, what's the best cure for blue balls? Couple nice drinky poos, that's the ticket. He gets a text on the phone from someone called Garrett, who seems frightened, saying they shouldn't have messed with those books, and that it's that thing from the tunnel. Hmm. Curious enough to at least respond, Will uses the finger smudges on the screen like some kind of tech hacking wizard to unlock the phone's passcode, telling Garrett that they left their phone at the bar, pausing momentarily when hearing more scurrying of cockroaches in his house, and one appears on the floor scuttling by before vanishing under a cabinet. The kid responds with a plea for help, but assuming it's just a prank, Will isn't interested, finally collapsing into a drunken slumber. The next morning, Claire has found the phone, questioning him about it, and seems to not quite trust his story, but to prove his innocence, he hands the phone over so she can see for herself, finding a new gruesome message in the chain, a bunch of teeth and a puddle of blood. He plays it off as no big deal and drops her off at school, where she gets a hug from a professor that Will is none too pleased with. Since he's not working, what is Will's life outside of working at the bar? Pretty much meaningless. His first stop being, where else? Rosie's bar for a nice 10 a.m. wake up drink. On the way, he spots a black sports car with a young woman inside, but she drives off as soon as he notices. Must be those college kids. Kids. He then checks on the wounded Eric, who is suffering from nightmares, asking Will to watch over him for a while, followed up by grabbing a sandwich where he runs into Alicia and Jeffrey. And to really spice the day up, it's back home for a nice round of video games on the couch. Phew! Tough day! Seriously, what is this guy's life? Just totally empty and meaningless. His big living is interrupted by more messages coming in on the phone, asking about his friend with the messed up face. Scrolling back through the phone's gallery reveals new horrors. A photo of a man with his brain splattered 
shattered, and then a video of his disembodied head on a table, one of the kids asking if they did it right, mentioning a book just as Garrett did. A bunch of cockroaches appear surrounding the head, and a small hand reaches out, spooking Will as Carrie comes home asking what he was looking at, but he doesn't say with good reason. Things then turn accusatory, and there doesn't appear to be that much trust in this relationship. Carrie annoyed that he's constantly around with these random girls all the time, while he's not too happy about the great Steve she spends so much time with to academically please, if not more. He relents and hands over the phone, and Claire gets to see the head for herself, also seeing the book the kids are referencing, The Translation of Wounds, which is ritualistic wounding. As usual, kids meddling with supernatural evil that they just don't understand. She wants him to call Garrett, but he's still sure it's all just special effects, deciding to call anyway to assuage her fears. On the other end, he hears muffled demonic breathing sound, which then become loud roars, hurting his ear and tossing the phone away. This from what we can tell is the important first stage of the process Will has been subjected to. By calling the kid, he has brought the same evil to himself, which manifests itself in many ways to push Will down a particular path. The first notable effect being on his anger. She wants to call the cops, but he thinks otherwise. A kind of primal rage momentarily consuming him, catching a flash of her head on a platter just like in the video. The presence is infiltrating his head with this image and showing him an easy solution to take care of those that cross him. Just cut off their heads, no big deal. He does at least agree to take the phone to his cop buddy Dwayne, but on the drive there he gets another text thanking him for calling, and confirms what it means, telling him that he has been chosen, saying that they need their phone back now and are right behind him. He glances back and the phone turns molten and melting, roaches then covering both of his arms. He swerves off the road, but when frantically brushing off the supposed roaches, there is nothing there. Everything he saw was just a hallucination in his mind, which is only going to get worse from here on out. His freak out attracts a group of gawkers, making it easy for the girl to grab her phone back and speed away before Will even gets the chance to do anything about it. And even without the phone, he still tries to explain to Dwayne about what happened, but without any evidence, there's really not too much they can go on. That night at the bar, Will is looking a bit more frazzled than usual, but a visit from a solo Alicia changes his mood. Turns out Jeffrey is also jealous of their friendship, and so she's here as punishment for his being selfish. She actually wants to try to restrain herself tonight and not drink too much, but Will is in dire need of a shitload of drinks, enlisting her as his drinking confidant. And how about some drugs too? Sure, why not? Time flies by, and Alicia laments on her failed attempt to hold back on the drinking, thinking she's wasting her life. But Will disagrees, declaring that she's living it. Yeah, if you say so, dude. And why stop now? So they take a bottle of liquor down to the waterfront where temptation gets the better of Will. Things starting to get frisky and he becomes a bit too aggressive, Alicia having to push him away. He defensively asks what's wrong, that puts Jeffrey? But she reminds him that he has a girlfriend too. He's like, don't worry about her, going in for another botched attempt. Again, he is acting a bit more unhinged than before and that same aggressive behavior has reared its head again. He obviously does not care about his relationship or hers as a matter of fact, it's just about what he desires, which he can no longer control. Drop her off. He tries to use the excuse that Carrie doesn't love him anymore, and she does apologize but still leaves. He gets a weird look in his eye, beginning to breathe heavily, those unbridled feelings coming out again. He gets rousted from his state by a call from Carrie that quickly disconnects, and then gets a bunch of pictures from their kitchen to his confusion. By the time he finally gets home, it's nearly dawn, discovering Carrie blankly staring at her laptop, an image of that tunnel on the screen, the same mentioned by Garrett, and where this mysterious evil thing apparently comes from. He shuts down on the computer and she doesn't know anything about the pictures or calling him, saying only that she feels foggy and heading to bed. Will searches the house, hearing noises from the pantry, greeted by a swarm of bugs in his face, and then finding he can't sleep, hears more odd noises sending him back to the kitchen, where a kid is now sitting at the table. It's obviously Garrett, spitting out his teeth in a bloody mess, his head also oddly pulsating as he talks, almost like something is trying to get out of his head. Will apologizes for not helping him, and Garrett fills him in on exactly exactly what happened. He says they performed a ritual that opened a portal that let something through possessing them. He tells Will he called it into his home and now it sees him as the perfect vessel for more evil, creepily informing him it's watching them right now in the bedroom, catching a glimpse of something there, which actually looks human, a kind of blurred outline of someone moving quickly, possibly Garrett. Then seeing that evil thing he was talking about, a big fleshy mass with what looks like a gigantic void within its pupils 
whatever it is, it's weird. Will coming to the next day, looking even sweatier and dirtier than usual. In the bathroom, he gets a horrific hallucination of body horror, a wound appearing under his arm all red and swollen. Cockroaches naturally proceed to emerge from the wound before disappearing. Even if a hallucination is probably still a good enough clue that it's time to take a nice hot shower. The vision causing him to scrub at his armpit until it starts bleeding down the drain. Carrie innocently asks about updates on the phone, but since he lost it, he gets testy with her, even though it was all his fault. And she pegs his whole thing pretty well, saying that some people look normal on the outside, but on the inside, it's just worms. Ouch! Harsh yet quite accurate, especially with his increasingly aggravated and degenerating behavior. He does at least do some good old-fashioned internet research into ritual wounding, finding talk of it on a message board. Always trust random internet message boards when it comes to the supernatural. That is one thing I've learned from horror movies. The same kid Garrett apparently posted there and says he's been having strange visions of a tunnel since starting to study the books. A reply telling him that the translation of wounds is a real Gnostic ritual of human sacrifice. The idea of being actually using wounds to transcend boundaries and connect with higher beings for power and enlightenment. Well, there you go. Sounds like old Garrett stumbled across this weird ritual thing, and even just by studying it, the evil entity was already showing him visions of the tunnel where it resides. With this information, we can decipher this entity is a god of the Gnostic religion, which is real. Paganism predating Christian Christianity, which eventually labeled them heretics when they grew in power. Their gods are called Aeons, who reside in a spiritual plane of reality called Paloma. By following the translation of wounds involving transgressions or injuries, they open the portal to Pleroma and bring gods through to our plane of existence. That's what we're seeing going on here, bringing a bad god with unimaginable power to our world, which is obviously a terrible idea. They must have killed someone and attempted to use that wound as a portal, even seeing the hand and a little portal coming out of the crack in the skull. But it obviously didn't turn out well for the kids, as bringing the entity over seems to have resulted in his friends being killed by it one by one. That's what happens when you dabble with unknown evil, which is now passed on to Will, who continues to become more testy and short-tempered. At an unusually busy night at the bar, yelling at a girl to get out of Alicia's seat, and getting annoyed when someone asks about Eric. When the couple do come, things are more than a little awkward. An already drunk Jeffrey trying to make a scene, obviously having learned of Will making a move, and proving his previous jealousy of their friend valid. He gets dragged out by Alicia, who becomes emotional, but Will isn't taking any of this to heart, calling him a little bitch. Setting out to clean up, he has another bout of being overtaken by the entity. Things slowing down, getting all distorted, and bugs show up all over the place. The sounds all drift away, leaving only Will's steady, heavy breathing, then entering into a crack in the wall, inside coming to the tunnel, and that weird fleshy eye thing again. Looks like someone's watching, Will. And he really is gross looking. What the hell? hell is that thing anyway? Some kind of flesh mask with an eyeball, I suppose. Weird photos of someone with a blurred face sent by Carrie sends Will home in a hurry, and he finds her again absorbed in her evil screensaver, totally zombified, having sat there long enough that she's Peter Pants. Wow, well, that's not good. And I'd say the same entity is messing with Claire as well, using the images of the tunnel to infiltrate her mind just as she did with Garrett. And based on her state here, it's almost like the god is feeding on her energy in a way via the screen and the tunnel images as though if Will hadn't shown up, she would eventually have been completely drained of her life force. However, it's obviously more focused on our boy Will, and his actions blow up what little he had in his pathetic existence. He tries to call Alicia, but she's had enough, thanks to his little assault that night by the water, and is even more devoted to Jeffrey. Well, one relationship dead. Next, the following morning, out of nowhere, he tells Carrie that they should break up, which only gets a casual okay in response from her. He tries to pawn it off as it being for her safety, but she mocks him. Him, knowing that he's no hero, and calls him a mock person, just a body, sending him in a huff to pack up his shit and leave. Now that he's blown that to smithereens, there's really only one thing left in his life, his bastion of hope and true home of Rosie's. Having a nice drink there, he asks for another, but Rosie doesn't think that's a good idea since he's about to start working, pretty reasonable, leading him to blowing up at her and burning yet another bridge. So with nowhere else to turn, he tries to shoehorn his way into Eric's filthy apartment, and frankly, I'm surprised that this dude is 
even still alive at this point, but he's aware enough to tell Will he's not allowed to stay here. Jeez, that's pretty harsh, dude. But he refuses to take no for an answer. Eric attempts to confront him, but a confused Will was told that he had actually called for him to come by. And Eric reveals that it was the so-called freaks, aka college students, that made him do it. And as a nice surprise, they said they have a present for Will. Well, golly, isn't that thoughtful? Thanks, kids. Throwing the weak Eric in bed, he searches for their present, discovering the same kid's phone in his nightstand. Immediately, a text comes in from someone called Jason, who must be another in their group, asking if he's found it, giving him the clue that it's wrapped in flesh. And Will then figures out what this means, that Eric is the wrapping, looking at his still wounded face. He calls his old pal Garrett, the ring echoing, only getting distorted screams in return, and sets the phone down, making it appear that the phone plays quite an important role here, acting also as a kind of gateway to the spirit realm. I mean, he is calling a dead kid and getting a bunch of weird noises, which seems to be drawing the bugs. I mean, something's got to be going on with the phone, magical demon phone? Fuck if I know. Eric begins to painfully moan, bugs appearing in a huge ass horde coming into the room from out of the sink and the windows, covering the entire apartment in a buzzing wallpaper of bugs. Eric's wound starts to grow larger inside, and Will calls into it, asking it to fix him and make him whole, opening his mouth wide up. Come on in, baby! A portal manifests within the wound, and though it's obscured between shitloads of bugs flying around, that weird fleshy guy thing enters into his mouth. Well, that was certainly bizarre. And from what we can tell, the ritual that he and the kids were involved with was a success, and he is harvesting the power and energy from this weird entity thing, literally ingesting it, allowing it to fully possess him. And based on its shape, perhaps the god needs a body of its own since it's just a kind of weird flesh blob, you know? We've seen throughout consistently that Will is definitely a loser, with no real desire to do anything with his life, even scoffing off college at one point. He truly is hollow inside, which this whole experience brings to light. He seems like a nice enough guy at first, but as he becomes thrust into the temptations of evil, his true self becomes exposed. That aggressive, unfeeling jerk who still drinks all the time. He really, we discover, as Carrie accused him of, is full of worms. He has no purpose at all, and sees that, hey, maybe ingesting this evil thing to get some power, sure, why not give it a shot? Not like I've got anything else on the calendar at the moment, even though he, like the kids, didn't really know what they were getting themselves into, and it seems like it didn't turn out too well for them in the end. Or who knows? Maybe he has new magical super evil powers now, shooting fires out of his eyes and whatnot. But the point here is that when it comes down to this final choice to accept the evil, specifically Will does not get any redemption. He blindly does something else in hopes of this giving him purpose, because he feels he isn't capable of being anything on his own. That about wraps it up for this ending explained for Wounds. As far as streaming originals go, this one was at least better than the average, and I did like its particular mix up of various genre influences, which it was able to concoct into a unique tapestry. Before we go, don't forget you can send me requests for any TV shows or movies you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. Phew! I don't know about you, but now I need a drink. About 50 of them. Yeah, buddy, time to live. Woo! <laughs> what did you guys think of Wounds and its ending? Would you have taken the deal with the mysterious evil force, or would you have had a heroic redemption moment? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.